Hello and welcome along to the VMTV Rugby Pod. What a weekend we have, Matt, joining me in the studio, as is Fiona Hayes from the car. Fiona, you look very comfortable there. How much are you looking forward to Saturday night? I'm really looking forward to it. Um, was out doing a bit of coaching there myself and it got me right in the buzz looking forward to this match. It's it's huge. It's the one we've all been waiting for. Yes, we've had some great group games, but I think it's we've all been dreading this quarter final. but we're confident going into it. Matt, just on that, there does seem to be, and rightly so, a good bit of confidence going into this one, even although Ireland's quarter-final record is very poor, to say the least, with the seven defeats. Yeah, it, and Stu, look, it's it's impossible not to speak about that history because Ireland have been so successful over so many years but just couldn't crack a quarter-final. Having said that, there were a lot of times I didn't think they were going to win quarter-finals. The rest of the country did. And I, people said, you know, you're just saying it to be a grumpy old bugger, and I wasn't. I believed it. But this is a completely different Irish side. You know, this is either one or two in the world, in my opinion. And it's not an opinion. 17 straight tells you this is a side that's worthy of winning. Five of the last eight against New Zealand. Like, there, there is a reason to be confident. There is a reason to have belief. It's, it's the difficulty of the draw that this is a quarter-final because it should be a semi-final. We all know that. But if it was a semi-final, I'd still be confident because uh, of n- not of uh, loyalty or faith, but of the proof of this Irish team and what they've done over the last two years. Fiona, I suppose the big boost is that Mac Hansen, as we see today, looks to be fit, and James Lowe. James Ryan, the only one missing out, and Jimmy O'Brien comes on to the bench. It's a massive boost to see both the starting wingers in there, isn't it, for Ireland? Yeah, look, it's it's a huge boost. I mean, that's, I talked to it mad as well in studio about this, and that was, I suppose, the biggest area we feared. Um, no disrespect to James Ryan, he's absolutely outstanding, but I suppose the calibre coming up after him, um, we see big Joe McCarthy on the bench. I'm excited at seeing him running out in the quarterfinal. Uh, there was, we weren't sure if it'd be Ryan Baird, but with the wingers, they're just performing so well. They're up there with the best wingers in the world right now, and they're so they offer this Irish team something different. We know Low and his big boot, his left boot is very much needed, especially at exits. He gives us such relief. But what Mac Hansen has done to this team is it's that X factor. He lights it up, his footwork, he scores some absolutely cracking tries from finding space from anywhere. So it's really exciting to know that we have these guys fit, hopefully fully fit going into this game. Matt, if we look at the record there, five out of the last eight that Ireland have beaten the All Blacks. You know, before that, they failed to win any of their first 28 matches, Mm. drawing one. Even just reading that off, I'm starting to get a bit of reality out of it, you know. As a kid growing up, like, you'd just be like, who makes up those stats? Yeah, yeah, no one beats Ireland 28 times, eh? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, look, look, you know, I was, you know, brought up in Australia. We were used to the five from eight, you know, through the 80s and 90s into the 2000s. And when you have that sort of numbers, you don't look at the, these great New Zealand times with fear. You look to them with excitement. You know, like you've got a shot. You've got to, you know you're going to have to be at your best. You know you're going to have to play brilliant. But when you've got those sort of numbers, five from eight, you really go in with belief. And that's what this team has. When you're going in zero from 28, there's a psychological barrier to overcome. Now, just as Australia now have with New Zealand, they, they just haven't been able to grab that Bledisloe Cup for, I think it's 23, 22 years now. So it's the mythology of the black jersey that is so well woven by the New Zealanders. It's a mythology that they, they cultivate by you know, putting out on, on social media, the book's all about it. And if you start buying into that, it's a psychological thing. They have an aura. But once you break their aura, you realise they're just, they're just players like the rest of us. You know, and they are bootable. They're great players. Don't get me wrong. They are a great team, and they they are worthy of our deepest respect. But they are bootable, just as the Irish team is worthy of our deepest respect. But those numbers do mean something. They mean something very different. Just as the numbers of what this Irish team has done in the last fifteen months mean something compared to two thousand and nineteen when they played New Zealand in a quarter final. Again, I was saying New Zealand are going to wallop us. They're just going to they're going to give us a hiding, and they did. 
Why? Because of the evident body of evidence beforehand. So the body of evidence before 2019 was saying New Zealand will win. The body of evidence here is saying this is going to be a cracking game, but Ireland can win this game. Fiona, I'm not saying beatable. And also, I think I'm going to say... New Zealand not as good as they used to be. <laughs> I'm going by Matt's evidence and the, the stats <laughs> he has down. I'm careful of saying that. What? Which way do you see it? Yeah, I think the first thing is they're definitely beatable. Um, I would have said a hundred percent coming into after watching maybe the France game and coming into the start of this tournament, I would have felt they're not as as good as they used to be. But definitely, I've seen a shift in in their confidence in how they're attacking. Um, I suppose we're you know that Joe Schmidt cohesiveness their breakdown work is a lot better um i'm seeing something they're like a team on the rise ireland were similar but we've kind of hit peak and what i'm impressed about ireland is that we've we're staying at that peak yes we're getting better and better each game but um i i really feel like ireland started the tournament at a higher level and we're slightly rising but also they are so it's it's trying to balance whether they've caught up to where we expect them to be and how and how they are playing is huge but i mean this squad um have like have so much talent in it but they've come out and said, look, they are better themselves. We, 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 You spoke about Aaron Smith saying that. And yes, I, I firmly believe that they are better. But what I think what's different about Ireland is that they're far more cohesive. We've really good individuals that work together in a brilliant system. I think New Zealand have X factor all over the place. But are they fully fitting into that system? I haven't seen it fully in any 80 minutes in a long time. Matt, since the historic series win for Ireland last year against New Zealand. What areas do you think they have got better in? I think the major one is the consistency of performance. It's, it's basically what Fiona's saying, but consistency... Like for, if, if you look back, you know, if you're a rugby nerd like Fiona and I, you look back at the histories, and I, I've come to the conclusion that World Cups are won about 18 months to two years out. So there's like a, a momentum that is built um, that is established 15 months, 18 months, 12 months before the World Cups. And if you go back, well, you know, you can go right back to 87, the incredible New Zealand side. The Wallabies in 91 beat New Zealand in New Zealand. So here's, the, here's a common common thread. Uh, South, South Africa in 95 drew uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the box. Sorry, sorry, the Wallabies in 99 did. 2003, England did. You start going through. The only exception is is the Springboks in 2007. And then obviously you've got the times when New Zealand won it. South Africa, the last ones. All of them beat New Zealand in New Zealand. And that is still the hardest joint in the world to go and win a, a game of international rugby. They are, they are, to beat New Zealand in New Zealand is the ultimate challenge. And when teams do that, they're injected with belief and momentum and confidence that just brings them on and brings them on. And this Irish team has played like that. The, the second part of that is the way this Irish team is playing. So I know it'll come up later, the Joe Schmidt factor. Ireland are playing a totally different game today than they were four years ago. It is unrecognisable what Ireland are doing. In defence as well. Ireland have close to the best defensive record in the world. Close to. Not just it's everyone focused on the attack, and the attack is brilliant. But defensively, this Irish side is absolutely rock solid. They showed that over the last 15 months. So... That belief, that intensity, usually comes out in your D. That's how you know. If you, if you, every time I go and watch a team, I watch how they defend, and I you say, "Wow, these guys have got spirit. These guys are really playing for something bigger than themselves in the way you you defend." Because great teams defend as much as they can have to, and this Irish team is defending really well. So if I look back on Irish teams in the past, let's say you know right back. Some of it is, at a certain point, it gets irrelevant. But but right back to two thousand and and three, they didn't defend the way they sh they could have, and that's cost them dearly at a lot of World Cups. So that's the one thing. The defence is one thing, but the victory in New Zealand that all those World Cup winning sides have in common, that to me is a huge huge factor in the belief that this size had. And when you come to this end of the tournament, it's more than just talents and systems and all that. The psychological game just ups its, its or brings its presence into the game by a considerable margin. 
And those sort of wins and that consistency over that period of time really plays into it. If you compare that to New Zealand, I know what Smith's saying, he's got better over the last 12 months. They've lost to Argentina. Yeah, that, that was the biggest point. You know, They're saying they've got better yeah. over the last 12 months. Where, where do you see that? And do you agree with them as well? Or is, is the rise not as good as what it needs to be? I, I, I think, Stu, this is linked in. I've got it written down here. This is an ageing team as well. Right, this this is an ageing team. So, you know, I've got the numbers written down here. T uh, Katie Taylor's 32. Um, Bowden Barrett's 32. Sam Whitelock's 35. Dane Cole's 36. Aaron Smith's 34. Um, uh, Brady Retallick's 32. Ageing teams and young teams have one thing in common. They are inconsistent. So the first 20 minutes of South Africa versus New Zealand in Christchurch was phenomenal rugby. New Zealand were like out of a movie. Spotless, precise, absolutely so quick. Against South Africa at Twickenham, they were the exact opposite. Now, there were yellow cards involved and red cards involved, but they were not precise. Against France at this tournament, in the only top quality tier one team they've played so far, they were poor. Mm. They were not precise. So mm. what Fiona's saying, and, and I, I agree with, as they played the weaker teams, they've been brilliant. But how are they going to go against another top line tier one team? And so I don't buy what Aaron's saying completely. I think it is that we are getting a great deal of inconsistency from this New Zealand side. If we look at their team, Fiona, you know, was picked last night. Tyler yes. Tyler Lomax back fit. Mark Talea dropped for disciplinary reasons. We don't really know the ins and outs there. Matt's got his conspiracies, but we won't go there. <laughs> Scott Scott Barrett getting the nod over Sam Whitelock. Uh, did you expect any other changes or settled enough team and is what you would have thought it would be? Yeah, look, it's settled enough. I think they're making a statement of intent with Ricky Ioni at uh, 13. I think Antonina Brown is just so defensively good. He hammers people. His line speed, his aggression is huge. Whereas as a 13, Ioni has a little bit of that. I would see it as a, as a, a way to go for Ireland to attack, to attack down his uh, channel around that decision making at 13. But on attack, what he offers you is just something special. His footwork, his offloading game, his ability to to get his hands free around defenders. He's he's just a different type of 13. And I think with that team, I wasn't sure what way they were going to go, but they they've obviously gone with that attack in mind focus, and and it's absolutely huge for them to have Lomax back. I'll tell you, Stu, because I th I personally think even in the as we say the tier two teams they struggled at scrum time. Yeah. Um, in particular, I think Ethan Groot, who's still in there, um, his discipline around scrum time hasn't been that great. So to have such a tight end as Lomax, it's just that area of that scrum. I really don't think that they're they're as strong. But um, you know, me and Maddie, we were talking about it beforehand as well. To have Finley Christie on the bench, where just Cam Rygard has been so good and Matt we've been in studio we've been talking about that mm. he just offers just such speed so that was something we thought as well around that area decision making and, and how come Christy has got himself onto that bench yeah Fiona you're right like I agree with you the scrummaging we, well we've been watching it in studio a couple of times they have really been in trouble at the scrums uh, which is, is an, a crazy thing to say about a team wearing a black jersey I mean I can't but it's a fact they have they have been and and Lomax I've I, I, haven't got that in front of me. I believe he's only got 40 minutes of rugby. Is that right? Is that something like that? At the yeah, World yeah. Cup, 40 yeah, minutes. World now, Cup, so, yeah, yeah. so that tells you how desperate they are to get him back in. And I, I, I do think, you know, Tyrell Williams coming off on the bench, you know, he's, he's okay, but he's been in trouble as well. So Ireland are really going to go at that. Remember, on, on Fiona's point, I think Porter and Furlong are going to go deep into the game. And then you're going to bring off, and one of the reasons I think they've got McCarthy on the bench is that weight when he comes on. So, so much of front row play, one blames the props, so much of it is the weight that's coming from behind him. And he is a big, big, strong young man, and he's going to put some weight on these guys coming off uh, off the bench late in the game. And I'm 100% with Fiona. I, I was really shocked that Roy Garb wasn't selected. Really shocked, because I think he's been outstanding to go to uh, in his games he's played. He started all the games. Um, uh, Christy hasn't started. Uh, I can't remember if he started. He's certainly played off the bench. But Roy Gard has just been outstanding, and everyone just assumed he's going to be on the bench. And so that, that to me, is a, a, a really uh, 
strange selection. We have to wait and see if, what happens with that. But a big plus for Ireland. A big, big plus for Ireland. This was just for the everyone, this kid's this kid is going to be a great player. This kid is Roy Guard's going to be a great player, and he's going to have that black. And when Aaron Smith's going, we believe this might be his last tournament or what times wearing the jersey. Roy Guard's going to grab that and hang on to it for a long time. Matt, stand with you. Talk to me about the ten fifteen. I know you picked analysis mm-hmm. pieces on it with uh, uh, Richie Mionga and Bowden Bart. How do you see that going in attack? Is it great to have two sort of ball players either side, but defensively, do you think that's a weakness? Yeah, I, 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 if I take the attacking side first, I do think they're brilliant in attack. I think, I think, and I'm a huge admirer of Bowden Bart. I think he's just slowed down a tiny bit. I just noticed, you know, his acceleration in the old days. Like that was just mind-boggling how fast that guy was. But his brother at 12 is also a, an access in that. We see him doing some kicking. Now, he's really, really come on in the in the in Geordie in the role of, of wearing the 12. It's in defence, I think, they have a problem. So what they do is they take Richie Munger out of the, out of the defensive line where a 10 would normally stay, put him in the backfield. And the French had a theory on it. The French went after their positioning in the backfield. So you have Barrett who is, you know, he's played a lot of 15 now, but he has been a 10, and, and Richie Munger in the backfield. And they actually do things off line, so they actually put the seven between the centres, the open side flanker out, put him between the centres. Really unusual stuff. And it's all about trying to hide Munger in defence because he's, he's missed a lot of tackles in this tournament. I think he's missed, in the quarterfinalist tens, he's missed more tackles than any of them. Uh, whereas uh, Johnny's been very, very solid. You know, big, because Richie's only a slight guy. He's not a big, big man. But, Again, a fantastic attacker. France absolutely attacked them with short kicking games and crossfield kicking games, and they got great return from it, from the positioning of Moyunga and Barrett in the backfield. As soon as Aaron Smith came into line, France chipped them. They went straight over the top. There is a lot of space behind that that New Zealand defensive line because of the way they are playing Barrett and Moyunga in the backfield. And I think Ireland will attack them. Um, and, and Fiona said it about Hansen. I hope he makes it. I'm still concerned with him to get through the game and even the warm-up with a calf six six days ago. That's really unusual to survive. But his short kicking game as well, he has kicked brilliantly at times for Ireland. So when you've got the kicking games of you know Connor Murray on the bench, uh, uh, Jamison Gibson Park, obviously Johnny, and then you can also put in uh, uh, Hanson off the wing where he quite often plays like a, like a 10 in, in the kicking game. I think they'll really get some joy in that backfield. Fiona? Andy Farrell, Joe Smith, mind games, no mind games. <laughs> it's all so interesting, isn't it? You know, how much does Joe Smith know, obviously, about the game? A millions, probably not many know more. But this Ireland team, you know, he did such a good job up to 2019. But there are some new players in there. And, you know, as a coach yourself, you know patterns and you know different types of plays. But, like, you know what Ireland will try and do, but... How big a say will he have, do you think, in trying to nullify their threats in attack specifically? Yeah, what I think about Joe Schmidt is he's a very, very different coach to Andy Farrell. He's so structured. He's so um, detailed about everything they do. Obviously, Andy Farrell is is detailed. But I think what Joe Schmidt was... um, it wasn't in a comfortable environment for a player if you weren't doing the right thing as he wanted. Whereas I think they have a little bit more freedom with Andy Farrell. He he lets them go at it and he's a sticker for detailing a, around that. But their decision making is on themselves. It's a totally, I think Johnny Sexton said it himself. It's not, um, he's not worried Joe Schmidt isn't the one going out making the tackles on the pitch. I think where Joe Schmidt comes into it is if there was a weakness in a player, he'd understand, you know, an Irish player and see what way to attack. And I just firmly believe this team at the minute are so well coached, so confident that there aren't any weaknesses for him to exploit. And it's completely different systems and it's completely different styles of play. So while he done wonders for Irish rugby and what a coach he is, I just don't think that he'll have a of not worried about that Matt no weaknesses to exploit the words from Fiona Hayes it's a big statement that <laughs> yeah well you know look I, I, I think this is a uniquely Irish thing the Joe Schmidt discussion um, Joe is going to he's an assistant coach of New Zealand he's going to have an influence on the game I think it's more in the media and, and the people off the field that are stressing this. It's been four years since Joe was here. And that's a long, long time to be away. Uh, the players are dismissing it. I dismiss it. 
not being disrespectful to Joe in any way. As I said, he's an assistant coach in New Zealand. He's going to have a big impact on the game. But uh, Fiona's right. They, they defend completely differently. They're attacking completely differently. They've got a framework that the players are allowed to do it, to do what they want. And more, most importantly, Sexton is empowered to run the show. Sexton is the conductor. He's, he's the guy running the thing. And that was not the case with Joe. Joe was running the show and, and everyone had to do what they're told. Sexton is out there and there's the framework. We know there's an attacking framework and Sexton just pulls what string he sees on the field at the time. And he is the best in the world at it still. So, look, I, I think it is vastly overstated here in Ireland. I think it's a scary rugby story that we tell the children to make them go to bed, you know, and they look for a, the rugby <laughs> boogeyman under the under the bed. You know, it's 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 just not going to be a factor. That it, it, Joe Schmidt is a factor because he's assistant coach of New Zealand, but it's not the factor that everyone's doing that he's got the secret code to Ireland. That's not the case. The one thing I think we can expect that, that they'll say, and I don't think this is Joe Schmidt being uh, overly uh, observant, New Zealand are going to run at Johnny because everyone has. Johnny's tackles count is high and they will be coming down his channel. And that I think we can say is going to be a New Zealand tactic. I think there'll be an aerial tactic as well. They'll kick. And the to me, where this game is going to be won and lost is the breakdown. Um, and everyone's, again, you know, let me put Joe's, everyone's talking about Joe Smith in the breakdown. What he did at Leinster and Ireland was brilliant. France actually absolutely took New Zealand apart at the breakdown in the opening game. And they schooled them. They took them apart. It was brilliant coaching from France. Now, New Zealand will be aware of that and they'll try and fix that up. It doesn't matter. That's still going to be the place. If Ireland can dominate, and so far they have them, I mean, they dominated South Africa, who are no slouches. If they can dominate New Zealand there, it's game over almost, I would say. That, that's 100, there'll be 150, somewhere around 120, 150, 200 of these, these collisions. And the team that dominates on those, and it has been Ireland in the past, will win that match. And I'm really confident, uh, more than I have been in other New Zealand Ireland matches, I'm really confident Ireland will, will be able to cope with that and come out on top on that. Would you go along with that? Are you very confident the breakdown that Ireland will come out on top, Fiona? Oh, yeah, I mean, in a way, Sue, it's also looking at, um, I suppose, you have to look at Wim Barnes. You always, when you're talking about the breakdown, you have to look at the referee True. that's refing the breakdown and you have to study him. I think Ireland have had a lot of Wayne Barnes and will understand how he likes to play. I think breakdown-wise, he's a little slower than other referees. So, you know, that by the laws, you, you sustain one clear out and you should get the penalty. I think Wayne Barron likes the player uh, the latch to sustain maybe two to three clear outs. So that means you've got to get your stance. Everything has to be perfectly balanced. So I think... Ireland would have done a lot of homework on that. I think every game I'm watching them, South Africa in particular, their decision-making around the breakdown, when to go for the poach, when to leave it off, when to bring line speed. It's just been so, so good. They'll have to up at another level to New Zealand, but it's the wider channels, I think, in particular, where they'll get great change. And we saw Audrey in particular, when he'd even sniffed that they were lacking maybe one or two um, defenders in, he goes after that ball. His ability to, I think it was you as well, Maddie. We were talking about it, his ability to assist the tackle and get that release immediately and beyond the ball. That's going to be key. But I'm very, very happy where Ireland are at the breakdown. I've seen huge strides even since the Six Nations. But as I said, it's going to be key to what the referee wants and what you can get away with as well. Before we finish the Irish chat map, you know, eight team wins in a row it would be if they did get it over. All obviously, it's all about the quarter final. But it would be, you know, joining New Zealand and England with the world record for the most consecutive Test match wins by a tier one country. So even that start, it just shows what a job Andy Farrell has done. Oh, it's a, uh, Shane Horgan has said it, and I don't mind quoting the big fella's words. It's been a revolution, not an evolution. And and the the Andy Farrell was the continuum coach of Joe Schmidt for two years, and it just wasn't working. Ireland were poor, and there was a revolution in that summer. After, after that Six Nations, when they beat England in the last game, which probably saved his job in some ways. I thought he was under severe pressure. And uh, they have been absolutely superb since. Been a, and a, you know, a joy to watch. 
Rugby, when they is played like the way Ireland are playing, it is a beautiful game. It's entertaining. It's great to watch. But here's the other thing: it's successful. It's success. It's winning. You know, it's winning games. And um, you know, I don't think we should. I know the Irish team won't. Don't think about a semi. Everyone, don't, don't even think about semis and finals. But if you can win this quarterfinal, if you win this quarterfinal, they can win the World Cup. And that's the Australian teams I was involved with. You know, not uh, uh, in particular in '95. I went to all the. I didn't go to the World Cup. I went to the camps with the, with the Wallaby team, and that was being drummed into them. If you can win that quarterfinal, just focus on the quarterfinal. And they didn't. They didn't focus on. There was a whole lot of things about professionalism and money going on in the background. They weren't focused. But if in '99 they did. Now Australia weren't the best team at that World Cup, but they got through the quarter. And the, and it's amazing how the dynamics change in the comp if you can get through that quarter. So Ireland, with all the stats we've just put up, they have got a great shot of that. And if they can get through this game and create history, and I think this team has already created history. They're used to it. They have got a great shot at the rest of the tournament. They are not even mentioning that. They are just saying, let's let's get through the 80 minutes on Saturday night in Paris. Forecast is good. No forecast of rain. It's looking positive. They want to take it on, and they've got a lot of self-belief. Fiona, last one. Are you expecting Ireland to attack New Zealand like they did against Scotland? You know that wraparound play, which seems to have worked since 1990? <laughs> That's still, that's always going to work. You know, it's very hard to defend. And the reason it works with Ireland is because they've so many options off that wraparound play. So it's never the same pop pass. We see, obviously, the movement is the same. But what you don't see in the background is there's actually probably four to five different options off every pass. Um, after that wraparound. So I think they have the ability and that tricks defenders and Ireland have worked so hard on that that it it, it is, it, as I said, it's so hard to defend. So I think we'll definitely see a few of those. I also think there's going to be a couple of line-out tricks uh, moves uh, uh, coming out in this game as well. They seem to kept it very basic at line out time I know they were struggling and there was a lot of talk about it but I, I feel like Paul O'Connell and, and his team are definitely going to have some strike plays coming off that line out something we haven't seen before um, we saw a beauty from Portugal so we saw a beauty from Portugal so maybe it might be something similar that, to one of those but we'll definitely see a few trick shots I think Getting exciting as we speak and We've got to touch some Portugal, actually, Matt. I don't want answers it's too long, but those scenes at the airport, what a joy they've been oh, in the World Cup. Fantastic, Class. wasn't it? Class. Absolutely brilliant. And, and people talk about the minnows coming and all that. Bringing these, these teams to the World Cup, that's not the problem. It's what we do in between World Cups to support Portugal and, and you know, or Chile and all these other countries. You know, it's bringing these, these countries where rugby's not used to the World Cup. Look what that's done to the rugby in Portugal. It's just fantastic. And they'd, and also, let me tell you, they got a great coach in, in Patrice Lajeskay. Like that, you know, he, mm. he really did a good job. Now it's up to World Rugby to support these teams better than they have done. Now, I know we had COVID. I know that, and that made it hard for everyone. But there has to be something where these guys get good quality international games, not just against the second tier, but you know, one every now and then against the top tier so they can raise their, raise their standards. No, definitely, because they... Certainly have some class in there and plenty of talent. Right, there are three other quarterfinals. Are there? Which we've maybe, maybe yes. forgotten about. <laughs> we'll try and break this up. Right, so Argentina-Wales, Matt, if we keep it short enough, which way do you see this going? Argentina improving, would that be fair to say, after that terrible performance against England? Have they made a big enough jump to scare Wales or even go and beat them? Yeah, scare Wales. Uh, before the tournament, Argentina, 100%. 100%. Gaddy said he's going to make Wales a hard team to beat. He has. Wales defence has been superb and they have lifted to, to their credit and to Gaddy's credit enormously. Argentina, the word out of the camp is they're training really well but not playing well. They're not transferring it. If Argentina come and play like they can play, they'll win. But they haven't played like we know or we believe they would play. So I think that's a really close game. On evidence, I'd have to say Wales, but I do think Argentina are more than capable of winning that. Fiona, we saw good glimpses against Japan, Argentina started to strike pretty hot, you know, the hat trick and started to play some pretty good rugby which way do you sit? 
I'm the same as Matt. I definitely think it's Wales. They're just so hard to beat. Argentina haven't given me enough in this tournament. Yeah. You know, we talk about how they've improved, but they were so bad in that first game, sk skill set wise. The knock ons, the penalties they gave away was crazy against England. I think they had nothing else to do but improve. So I haven't seen enough for them. I'm a huge fan of how they play the rugby. But for me, Matt says about the training on the pitch, I haven't seen anything really clicking. Some beautiful tries, but their restarts and letting people back into a game after they've scored these magnificent tries is crazy. And I think Wales are a, a big team to monopolise on that. So double Wales win then. So England, Fiji. We've just actually heard Owen Farrell back at 10. Marcus Smith starts you know you can tell by look you haven't even seen Marcus Smith is starting at fullback which is really interesting because Freddie Stewart has played 20 what is it 8 out of the last 29 tests to win or 29 out of the last 30 for England and he's made the call Smith at fullback come on Fuji come on Fuji <laughs> 4 dropped and Farrell in at 10 yeah wow wow okay coach knows best but why was Smith? Now this was this is sort of a typical of Borthwick's era. Why do it at a quarter final if you're going to do this? Why not give Smith more time at fifteen? Now he's had some time. I'm a great uh, fan of Smith with a ball in hand. Now the, the difference the Fijians have is this: they they're really well coached. Simon Raului is their is their coach, a smart smart dude. Known Simon for many many years. He's, he's, he's Sid, born Sydney Fijian family. I guarantee you, Marcus Smith's going to get sick of looking up and seeing a ball coming down and 10 very big, strong Fijians running very fast, hitting him. And I would not be surprised if one or two of them hit him <laughs> before that ball touches him. <laughs> you know, He is going to get physically attacked. Um, I, I can see what they're doing. They, they, they lost to Fiji at Twickenham, yep. and uh, I think they're trying to uh, uh, change that. Uh, I think every time they take Ford out, they struggle. They really struggle because I think Owen Farrell is a world class twelve, and he's a he's not a world class ten at this stage of his career. But it might be enough to get him to a semi final because Fiji are playing with the weight of expectation on their shoulders. Since they beat Australia, the, the fear of losing has been on them. I think they'll get to the quarter final, and that fear will be go. Like they've they've achieved what they set out to do. There's no everyone expects them to lose. Let's go. I think it could be a great game. I I, I can I tell you, I actually fancy Fiji. You fancy Fiji. Fiona, interesting with Fiji, you know, after those wins are against Australia and Georgia, I know they lost narrowly to Wales, but was the case against Portugal you felt that maybe, no, they weren't holding something back, but it was merely they had done their big matches to get to a quarter final and they were sort of just not quite at it? And would that give you a wee bit of a concern going into England? Or do you think they can actually beat them just like they did at Twickenham in the summer? I... Look, I, I think my heart is saying Fiji, my head is saying England for that game. Um, look, what kind of what crossed me when I was watching Fiji was how tired they looked. I thought as the game progressed, um, they didn't, you know, they wanted to, to carry hard, but they lost all shape. It just went absolutely out the window towards the end of the game. And that's no disrespect to Portugal. They're an exceptional side and they really fronted up defensively in particular in this game. And I suppose Fiji were a little shell-shocked, but they just looked wrecked after the match. It's like they were emotionally drained. I know there had been, obviously, in the week before, there had been a death in the camp as well. Um, so I, I would. It, there's a lot of emotions going through you for that game week, and it, it, it's got a you know it's got a hurt, and it comes out in some sort of way. But I, I felt like as the tournament has gone on, they they their fitness doesn't look as as sharp as I'd like to see it being. Now I know they have the ability to tack from everywhere, and we'll see this in the England game. But I think for this one, England will just have enough uh, have enough at set piece, and especially line out time and physically dominating them if. They can control the game, and I agree with Matt. When you take Ford out, you're 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 not controlling things. I think he's the best operator of doing that that England have right now. But when when you take that out of it, it'll it'll be a balance. But I I just think England's fitness will come out in this game. One vote for Fiji, one vote for England. How good is that? Last but not least, ridiculous saying that. Mm -hmm. Boulders France against South Africa. No words needed, Matt. No, great game. Great, great game. Um, 
just can't wait for Sunday night to see that. There's, you know, we've got two absolute belters on our hands. I, 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 I'm a bit of an outlier here and everyone I talk to. I haven't spoken to Fiona about it, actually, but... Well, do now. Please do. Yeah, no, no, I will. I'll, tell, I'll give Fiona my... She can, <laughs> she can shoot me down. I'll, I'll give Fiona a rider sitting in the back of the car there. She needs all the help you can get there. <laughs> I won't make it hard for you, Fiona, in the back of the car. There, the... the, the Fiji, uh, sorry, the, the South Africans' nightmare is France because everything mm. they do well, France do better. France, they talk about a bomb squad. France have a bigger bigger bench, a better bench. Centres, France have bigger, faster centres. Scrum half, best scrum half in the world's back with, from a fractured cheekbone. Goal kickers, they're kicking the highest percentage goal kickers of the two French kickers. The, they, France can match it physically with them, but they can also play rugby. They're not intimidated by France. They beat them at this same venue last year. The South Africa against Ireland or New Zealand, they would love. France France is not the team they wanted in this game. I here's the other part. France are inspired by their nation. Now this is this could go this is like the Ireland New Zealand game. This could go either way. But like everywhere I go people tell me no South Africa, South Africa, South Africa. I'm going, okay. Right, I don't think so. I think France are going to win this, and I th I think th that France are going to win it because they'll nullify everything that South Africa are good at. Fiona, the floor is yours. No, Matthew, all I would say that... is Pollard is on the bench. Pollard is on the bench. <laughs> I think Maddie were agreeing on this one. I've said from day one. I think it's going to be a France Ireland final. Um, I. 100% think that South Africa, when they play France, they get rattled with that physicality. No other team can match that. They almost change up how they play and it doesn't suit them. I know Pollard's on the bench for kicking goals, but the great old DuPont is back. They have the whole nation behind him. I think it's going to be a really intriguing battle, but I, I firmly believe France will be in that semi-final. Right, Matt, I've forgotten already. Who are your four semi-finalists? Let me guess. Ireland, did you say? Yep. Wales? Yeah, the the, the uh, let me say what Ireland and South and uh, France. I apologise, Ireland and France. Who they who they they play? Yeah, that's that's tough. That's tough. <laughs> that's what I'm asking you. I, I, I'm I'm going <laughs> to say Wales, and I, I I'm going to say Fuji because because you did five minutes. Yeah, ago. no, no, I'm going to say Fuji because. And I was thinking what Fiona said. We're brought up to say England. We're brought up to say England in that. And I'm I'm going to step back from from what I'm brought up on. I'm going to I'm I'm looking for an upset. There's always an upset in a quarter, and I love Fiji to upset them. I think I actually think England will win, but I'm I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say against the Fiji. crowd. Matt. That's why I'm always I'm going to like say you. Fiji. And Fiona, Ireland. Yeah, I'm, Wales. I'm saying. Yeah, I'm definitely saying Ireland, Wales, and unfortunately England. I don't want to say it, but it's going to be. Um, I think it's going to be England, France. Well, Matt, Fiona. From the car, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> and we can't wait for Saturday night. Don't forget to join in on Virgin Media 1 at 7 o'clock as Ireland take on New Zealand in one of the biggest matches of Irish history.